Hey guys, and welcome back to my True Crime Story channel. Um, the next book I'm going to be uploading is Killer Kids Volume 2. So let's just get right into it. Um, the first story is... The first case is Robert Tulloch and James Parker. On the frigid Saturday morning of January 27, 2001, Professor Roxana Verana piloted her car through the quaint village of Etna, New Hampshire. Professor Verona was on her way to a dinner date at the home of Dartmouth College co-workers Half and Suzanne Zantop, who taught geology and political science, respectively. The couple, originally from Germany, had been on the front faculty of the Ivy League University since the mid-70s and were popular with staff and students alike. Professor Verona pulled into the Zantop's driveway at around 6.30 p.m., Fresh snow had fallen in the last few hours, and she could hear it crunching under her boots as she walked up the drive. Lights were on in the house. Suzanne had told her guests that the front door would be left unlocked, so Verona didn't bother knocking. She turned the knob and stepped inside. Immediately, she sensed that something was wrong. There was no smell of cooking and not a sound from within. Suzanne, Verona called out, Half, where are you? No reply. The professor then walked down the hall to the kitchen where she noticed the ingredients for the meal laid out on the counter, but no indication that Suzanne had started cooking. That was odd. Suzanne? Half? Verona tried again. Still nothing. Worried now, she set off through the house, looking for her friends. That search took her eventually into the study, and it was there that she found them, lying on the floor and missed a scene that resembled something out of a horror movie. Professor Veranda turned immediately and fled, not even bothering to check for signs of life. No one could have survived the loss of that much blood. She charged headlong through the house, almost coming to grief on the slick drive as she fumbled for her car keys. Then she was backing out, over-revving the engine, racing to the home of the nearest neighbor. All of this passed in a flash that she would barely recall later on. In no time at all, the Zantops' tidy college cottage was taped off as a crime scene. Then detectives and, the, and CSIs got to work. Some clues were immediately apparent. There was no sign of forced entry. There was a partial bloody boot print on the wooden floor. Two 12-inch long black plastic knife sheets lay discarded on the floor, each embossed with the letters SOG. The weapons were nowhere to be found, but the sheets suggested that there had been two knives used in the slaughter. That, in turn, hinted at two killers. Was this a planned murder, a burglary gone wrong? If it was the latter, then the burglar was a rank amateurs. They left behind jewelry, silver, expensive electronics, and computer equipment. They'd also passed up on the couple's valuable art collection in their antique books. In fact, the only thing that appeared to be missing was Half's wallet. So this was likely not a burglary. In fact, two aspects of the crime pointed to a personal motive. First, the lack of forced entry suggested that the killers had been willingly admitted to the house. Second, the method of murder and the extreme overkill hinted at a rage field attack. The question was, who might have borne such hatred against the popular college professors? Half and Suzanne's Dartmouth colleagues were certainly no help in this regard. They simply could not fathom why anyone might want to harm the couple. Suzanne was described as gregarious fun-loving and full of energy. She had a zest for life and loved cooking. Often she'd bake cookies for her students. Half was more introverted than his wife, a thoughtful, patient man whose friends and colleagues called Mr. Sweetness. Those same friends said that the idea that anyone might have harbored a grudge against him and Suzanne was preposterous. And yet someone had killed the Zantops and done so much, done so in such brutal fashion that the entire Dartmouth campus exited existed at the time, that time under a pall of fear. What if the killers were among them? What if they were even now contemplating their next crime? Suspects came quickly and fast in the early weeks of the investigation. As the person who had found the victims, Professor Verona was briefly considered and just as quickly dismissed. Then there was a local eccentric, a dishwasher, who had been fired from a restaurant owned by the college for claiming that college administrators were involved in various conspiracies. In the aftermath of the Zantop murders, this man had posted his own theories online, some of which came dangerously close to the facts of the case. The suspect was tracked to his current residence in South Dakota, but was ultimately cleared of involvement. 
Not long after, half Zantop's teaching assistant pointed out someone had he believed might have both motive and opportunity to kill the Zantops. The man was a Dartmouth geology graduate who had expressed a burning desire for, for, for a professorship at the university. The person standing in his way was half Zantop, who currently held the post. This man, too, was inv investigated and cleared as a suspect. There were, of course, other avenues being pursued at that time, and one of those yielded a valuable clue. Investigators had lifted a couple of fingerprints from the knife sheets found at the crime scene, and although there was no match on the FBI database, it nonetheless gave them a reference point if and when they made an arrest. And the sheets would yield an even more valuable clue when Dodge Detective work led investigators to SOG Specialty Knives and Tools, a company based in Linwood, Washington. They would there they learned that the sheets were from a knife branded as the 84 SOG Seal 2000, a recent addition to the product line with a limited production run to date. The detectives then obtained a list of stockists in New England and began calling on them, eventually zeroing in on Fox Firearms in Situate, Massachusetts. The owner confirmed that he carried that particular knife and said that he had only sold two of them, both to a man named James Parker. Parker, as it turned out, lived in Chelsea, Vermont, just 30 miles from the Zantop residence in Etna, New Hampshire. On the surface, this looked like a valuable lead, but just when investigators were getting excited about the prospect of solving the murders, their enthusiasm was dampened. James Parker turned out to be a 16-year-old high school senior with no police record. Checking in with local cops revealed that he had never been in any kind of trouble. When the New Hampshire detectives brought him in for questioning, he seemed surprised to be asked about the knives. He nonetheless admitted buying them, saying that the second knife was for his friend Robert Tulloch. They'd bought them for camping, he said, but had found them too unwieldy and had therefore sold them to a stranger. Rob Tulloch was just as cooperative as his friend. Like James, he agreed to be fingerprinted. He also volunteered to give up his boots and shoes for testing and offered a viable explanation for the cut that had been noted above his eye after the Zantop murders. He said that he'd fallen in the woods and had hit his head on a half-buried metal canister. The police had no reason to disbelieve him. In fact, they were beginning to think that their promising lead was taking them up a blind alley. But, the feel that, but that feeling of frustration only lasted until the following morning. That was when John Parker phoned the police to tell them that his son was missing. A call to Rob Tulloch's home revealed that he, too, had vanished. It appeared that the suspects had gone on the run, and the reason for their sudden disappearance would soon become clear. Throughout the day, there were reports from the New Hampshire Crime Lab. First, Rob Tulloch's boots were matched to the bloody print found in, Zant in the Zantops' home. Then, fingerprints from both suspects were matched to those found on the knife sheets. Finally, after carrying out searches at the boys' homes, officers found the knives hidden in a cardboard box in Rob's room. One of them would prove to have Suzanne Zantop's blood on it. The other had blood that would be matched to her husband. A warrant was immediately issued for the teenagers, and a manhunt was launched. That soon turned up Jim Parker's car, found abandoned at a truck stop. The police also learned that the boys had talked to several truckers trying to hitch a ride to California. They hadn't made it that far, but they had managed to work their way to New Jersey, where a driver named James Hicks took pity on them and agreed to help. Hicks was only going to was Hicks was only going as far as Indiana, but en route he got on his C B radio to inquire whether there was anyone who could take the boys west. Unbeknownst to Hicks, the frequency was being monitored by the police. One of the officers posing as a trucker offered to give the boys a ride all to the west coast. He then arranged to meet them at the Flying J truck stop. When they arrived, the police were waiting for them. Tulick and Parker were taken to Henry County Jail in Newcastle, Indiana, where they were photographed and fingerprinted. They were later transferred back to New Hampshire, where, in November 2001, a state court ruled that they would be tried as adults. That rendered them eligible for the death penalty, but prosecutors stated from the outset that they were not seeking that sanction due to the youthfulness of the defendants. They were, however, facing life in prison with the possibility of parole. 
Jim Parker subsequently struck a deal, allowing him to plead guilty as an accessory to second-degree murder and the killing of Suzanne Zantop only. The agreement meant a prison term of 25 years to life with parole eligibility in 16 years. All he had to do in exchange was to sell out his buddy. The plea deal was met with widespread anger in the media and professional circles. Rob Tulick's legal team was particularly incensed. In response, they stated their intention to plead their client not guilty by reason of insanity. On December 7th, Parker entered his guilty plea as an accessory to second-degree murder. Under the terms of the deal, he agreed to reveal the truth about the Zantop murders. The story he told shows a remarkable na naivety. It is all the more terrifying for it. According to Parker, he and Tulick had determined that they would not attend college at the school, despite having the grades to do so. They decided and said they wanted to travel and chose Australia as a destination. By their estimation, they would need $10,000 to cover airfares and living expenses for a year. They also rejected the idea of working to raise money. Stealing it would be faster and easier. Their initial plan was credit card fraud, and they even went as far as stealing mail from mailboxes to obtain credit card numbers. But once they had the numbers, they didn't know what to do with them, and so the idea was abandoned. Next, they stole a Honda ATV, hid it in the woods, and then tried to sell it online. They even hooked a buyer who offered $3,000, but since they did not have the registration papers, the buyer backed off. Disappointed, the teens sat down to discuss their next move. It was during those discussions that the idea of robbing and killing people first came up. According to Parker, it was Tulek who first floated the plan, saying that the experience would stand them in a good stead as they could live as criminals once they got to Australia. Jim thought that he made a good point, and so they started discussing more in-depth plans for their crime spree. Their idea would went something like this. They would trick their way into someone's house, overpower them, and tie them up, and then torture them into giving up their PIN numbers. They'd kill their victims, steal whatever they could, f they could from the house, and then clear out the victim's bank account. Both agreed that it sounded like a workable plan. However, the first homeowner they tried to pull their trick on was suspicious and refused to let them in when they asked to use his phone. This may have had something to do with the fact that the boys were dressed all in black and looked like a couple of commandos. Undaunted, Tolik decided to tweak the plan. They would now knock on the door claiming to be a couple of students doing an environmental survey. This too failed. The householder said that he was towering his pool and did enough time for them. On January 27, 2001, Tolik and Parker decided to try their ruse again. That was the day that Parker borrowed his mom's Subaru, and the pair drove to Edna and ended up knocking on the door of a house in Trescott Road, the home of Half and Suzanne Zantop. As lifelong educators, the Zantops were only too happy to help a couple of fresh faced students with their class project. That turned out to be a tragic mistake. Once inside, Half sat the boys down in the living room while Suzanne remained in the kitchen chopping vegetables for lunch. Tulik started asking his survey questions in a faltering manner while Parker took notes, but Tulik hadn't really prepared for this, and after just a few questions, half stopped him. He suggested that they really should have put their questionnaire together in a more structured way and offered to set up an appointment for them with someone at the university who could help. You really need to be more prepared, half chided gently. Little did he know that those words would serve as a tip wire for the volatile Tulik. He immediately forgot the plan he and Parker had con concocted about tying up their victims and getting their pin numbers. In a flash, there was a knife in his hand. He was lurching across the room towards half. Before the professor could respond, Tulik was on him, slashing and stabbing in a frenzy of movement. Suzanne, hearing the commotion, came running into the room, screaming. Slit her throat, Tulik shouted to his companion, and Parker immediately comp complied, jabbing his knife into Suzanne's neck and drawing it across her flesh, severing veins and arteries on its path. Suzanne collapsed on the floor, gurgling sounds coming from her mouth as she tried to breathe. Meanwhile, Tulik was hacking through Half's throat, even though his victim was, in all likelihood, already dead. He then crossed the room and walked to where Suzanne was trying desperately to stem the flow of blood from her neck wound. The professor, who had loved life so much, was put to death 
when Tulik repeatedly thrust the knife, his knife through her skull into her brain. The teenage killers then dragged their bodies into the study before lifting Half's wallet and fleeing. The take from their savage double murder was just $340. In March 2002, Rob Tulick instructed his attorneys to drop the insanity defense. At his subsequent trial, he entered a guilty plea and accepted a sentence of life prison without parole. He is currently incarcerated at the New Hampshire State Prison in Concord, where Jim Parker was also serving his time. Parker will, of course, be free one day, whereas Rob Tulick never will. As for the Xantops, they are sadly missed by their two daughters and by friends and colleagues at Dartmouth. Their only crime was to open their home to two young men who asked for their help. That kindness would condemn them both to a horrible death. As of the posting of this video... James Parker and Robert Tulick are currently still incarcerated. Tulick is still serving life without parole, while Parker will be getting out sooner rather than later. Um, he should be out by next year, sadly enough. But yeah, that's the update on this case, and on to the next one. Maurice Bailey. Christina Grill had often told friends that she hoped to have kids with her boyfriend, Maurice Bailey. Except, in Christina's vision of this joyous future event, she and Maurice had already graduated high school and were living together, perhaps even married. She had not expected nor wanted to fall pregnant at 15. Now Christina was frantic with worry. Not everyone was accepting of their interracial relationship, and Maurice's father was particularly opposed. He'd once told Maurice that he'd kill him if he ever got that white girl pregnant. And so Chrissy was faced with a problem, one that was far too complex for an immature teenager to deal with. Should she tell her parents that she was pregnant? Should she keep the child or have an abortion? She already knew where Maurice stood on the issue. He was adamant that she had to terminate the pregnancy. They were too young, he'd said. They had their whole lives ahead of them. That made sense, of course, but Chrissy had entertained it for less than a few minutes before pushing it aside. Her mind was made up. She was keeping the baby she'd conceived with the boy she loved. While Chrissy Gill was coming to this mon mon monstrous decision about the child she was carrying inside her, her 15-year-old boyfriend Maurice was wrestling with problems of his own. How he how he'd made it clear to Chrissy that she had to get rid of the baby, but he wasn't sure that his message had hit home. What if she decided against his wishes to keep the child? That would put him in a very difficult position. His father had made his feelings clear about the relationship. Once, after the old man had caught him and Chrissy in bed together, he'd beaten Maurice with, to within an inch of his life. Who was to say he wouldn't go a step further when he heard that Maurice had gotten Chrissy knocked up? No, Maurice decided whether she liked it or not, Chrissy was terminating the presidency. And once that was done, Maurice was going to break up with her. She just wasn't worth the hassle. Having come to those dual re resolutions, Maurice suddenly felt a whole lot better about life. But Maurice's newfound sense of contentment would not last long, only until that afternoon, in fact. That was when Chrissy called him up and dropped the bombshell. She was keeping the baby. Not only that, but she would be informing her family about her pregnancy later that same evening. No amount of ranting by Maurice could shake Chrissy from her firm conviction. Eventually, he calmed down, and the pair of them spoke for about ten minutes, mapping their path forward. They were allies they could count on. Maurice's mother, Deborah, for one. Deborah liked Chrissy and had welcomed her into their Bailey home. Chrissy's mom, on the other hand, had never met Maurice, but Chrissy was sure that she'd come around when she'd learned that she was the that he was the father of her unborn child grandchild. It will all be all right, Chrissy assured him. As long as we love each other, you do love me, don't you? Of course I do, when Maurice replied. You know I do. I love you too, said Chrissy. More than anything, the couple then made an arrangement to meet later that afternoon to discuss how they were going to break the news to their respective families. The rendezvous was at an elementary. 
The rendezvous was at an elementary school playground near both of their homes in Crafton Heights, Pennsylvania. The afternoon of Saturday, November 6, 1993, was cold and drizzly. Christina arrived first at the meeting place and took up a position on a bench from which she had a view along the path that Maurice would take. Now she spotted him, hustling along in a half crouch against the chill. The sight of him couldn't help but bring a smile to her face. She loved him so. Rising from the bench, she waited for Maurice to reach her. She opened her arms to hug him as he approached. That was when she saw the knife in his hand. The attack was fast, targeted, and brutal. Chrissy, caught entirely by surprise, didn't stand a chance. The blade cut deep into her neck and into her abdomen, slicing through vital veins and arteries. As she collapsed to the ground, Chrissy was already beyond help. Maurice then leaned over and zipped up her windbreaker in an effort to conceal the bloody carnage he wrought. Then he turned and stalked off, leaving Christina to bleed out on the ground. By the time he exited the school grounds, she was dead. So, too, was the child growing inside her, his child. A group of neighborhood children found Christina's body later that afternoon. The police were then called, and Chrissy was quickly identified. From there, it didn't take long for detectives to hone in on a suspect. Christina kept the journal in her room, one in which she'd recorded every small detail of her relationship with Maurice Bailey, including their plans to meet that afternoon. Billy was taken into custody that same night. His first words to the arresting officers were, I figured you'd come. As in any murder case involving a juvenile offender, the first order of business was to determine whether Bailey should be tried as an adult or as a juvenile. Bailey's legal team fought hard for the latter, but when that failed, they switched to a backup strategy. Their defense was built around the pressures the 15-year-old had been facing at the time of the murder. A baby he didn't want, a girlfriend he was trying to break up with, a father who was threatening him with violence. He was pushed into a position where he saw only one way out, Bailey's lawyer asserted. It was an argument that gained very little traction with the jury. Maurice Bailey was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He is currently incarcerated at the Fayette State Correctional Institution in western Pennsylvania. Update. As of 2017, Maurice Bailey is still serving life in prison. Um, They're looking to... um, make his sentence longer than it already is, looking at him serving another 31 years before he's eligible for parole. So that's the update on that case. And the third case we're going to talk about, we're going to read in this video, is Melinda Loveless. All right, let's get into it. On a crisp winter morning in 1992, a Chevrolet sedan pulled to the shoulder of a gravel road just outside of Madison, Indiana. Three teenage girls dressed in jeans and sweatshirts exited the vehicle, two of them moving with purpose, the other with what appeared to be a reticence. A fourth girl remained in the car. One of the girls, a pretty dark-haired teen, approached the trunk and threw it open. Inside lay the brighter body of another girl. Her name was Shenanda Scharer, and on the last day of her life, January 11, 1992, she was only 12 years old. Her crime? She had become involved in a relationship with the former girlfriend of one of her attackers. Shenanda Scharer was born in Pineville, Kentucky on June 6, 1979. After her parents' divorce, she moved with her mother, Jacqueline Vaught, first to Louisville and later to Jeffersonville, Indiana, where she was enrolled at Hazelwood Middle School in June 1991. Shenanda was a popular student who was active in volleyball, softball, and cheerleading. However, her mother was less enthused about some of Shenanda's other extracurricular activities, specifically her friendship with a fellow student, Amanda Harvian. Jacqueline suspected that the relationship might be sexual. In an attempt to separate the girl, she moved to Shenanda to a Catholic school, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, in New Albany. But Jacqueline Vaught wasn't the only one to take notice of the relationship between Shenanda and Amanda. 
Amanda's ex-lover, Melinda Loveless, was watching too, watching and quietly seething with anger. Like Shenanda Shower, Melinda Loveless was the product of a broken home. But where Shenanda's upbringing had been relatively stable, Melinda's was chaotic, characterized by infidelity and substance abuse on the part of both of her parents, as well as accusations of sexual abuse towards Melinda and her sisters. By her early teens, Melinda was openly gay, something that did not go down well with her mother. In early 1990, 14-year-old Melinda began dating Amanda Harvian. However, the relationship was soon in trouble over Melinda's obsessive jealousy. By the time Shenanda Shower arrived on the scene, Melinda had moved on and was seeing an older girl. That is until she heard about Shenanda and Amanda. Then she was back, issuing threats of violence once confronting Shenanda in public. When that failed to get the desired result, she began thinking about murder, roping her friend Lori Tackett into the plot. On the evening of January 10, 1992, 17-year-old Tackett, along with two 15-year-old friends, Tony Lawrence and Hope Rippey, drove from Madison to Melinda Lovelace's house in New Albany. Lawrence and Rippey had not previously met Loveless and believed that they were going to attend a rock concert. It was only after they arrived at the Loveless home that Melinda showed them a knife and told them that she was going to use it to scare Shenanda Shower. The two girls, who did not know Shenanda, readily agreed to the plan. The foursome drove to Jeffersonville, Indiana, arriving at Shenanda's home just before dark. They had discussed their plan on the drive over and decided that Rippy and Lawrence would knock on the door and introduce themselves as friends of Amanda Harvin. They would tell Shenanda that Amanda was waiting to meet her at the Witch's Castle, a dilapidated stone college overlooking the Ohio River that local teens sometimes use as a makeout spot. But things didn't go quite as planned. Shenanda said that she couldn't get out of the house while her mother was awake. She asked them to come back later. The four girls then drove into Louisville, where they attended a punk rock concert. When they returned to the house at around 12.30 a.m., Tackett and Rippy went to the door while Lawrence sat behind the wheel and Loveless hid under a blanket in the back seat. Shenanda was told to sit in front. As they drove towards Witch's Castle, Rippy began questioning her about a relationship with Amanda Harvin. Shenanda answered these questions freely. In the back seat, still hidden under the blanket, Loveless listed and quietly fumed. Eventually, she could stand to hear no more and sprang from her hiding place, pushing the knife to Shenanda's throat. Now she took over the interrogation, demanding answers from Shenanda about her sexual relationship with Amanda. As their destination neared, Shenanda became increasingly fearful. By the time they reached Witch's Castle, she was sobbing hysterically. The girls forced Shenanda inside, where they had bound her hand and foot with some rope Loveless had brought along for that purpose. Loveless then began taunting Shenanda, threatening to hack off her hair and removing Shenanda's jewelry and handing it out to the other girls. By now, Shenanda was crying so uncontrollably that Loveless and her associates feared someone might hear her if they arrived at the cottage. They therefore took Shenanda back to the car and drove off. While Loveless and Rippy continued taunting Shenanda, Tackett drove them to a local garbage dump. There, Loveless and Tackett pulled Shenanda from the vehicle and ordered her to strip. They then took turns beating her with a tire iron, and after she fell and was unable to get up, used the same implement to sodomize her. Finally, they took turns stabbing the fallen girl before strangling her with a length of rope. Believing that Shenanda was dead, Loveless and Tackett dumped her body in the trunk of the car and drove towards Tackett's home in Madison. When they arrived, they went inside to clean themselves up. They had be barely begun when Shenanda regained consciousness and began screaming and thumping on the inside of the trunk. Of the trunk, after that, the screams might wake her mother. Afraid that the, the afraid that the screams might wake her mother, Tackett grabbed a parking paring knife and ran out to the car. She returned a few minutes later, covered in blood, and told the others that she stabbed Shenanda to death. It was now 2.30 a.m. and the girls had to start thinking about disposing of their victim's body. It was decided that Tackett and Loveless would do the job, while Lawrence and Rippy stayed behind. Yet, despite the horrendous torture meted out 
on her. Shenanda was still not dead. She again began screaming, whereupon Tucker pulled over, opened the trunk, and beat her unconscious with a tire iron. Loveless and Tackett arrived back at Tackett's house just before daybreak. After picking up Rippy and Lawrence, they stopped at a gas station in Madison to fill a two-liter Pepsi bottle with gasoline. Then they drove to a remote area off U.S. Route 421, where Tackett and Rippy wrapped Shenander in a blanket and carried her into a field. Loveless accompanied them while Lawrence, perhaps now realizing the implications of what they were about to do, refused to participate and remained in the car. A few moments after her friends walked into the field, Lawrence saw a lick of flame and smelled seared flesh. An autopsy would later reveal that Shenanda Shower was still alive when she was set alight. Shenanda's body did not lay undiscovered for long. That same morning, hunters chanced upon the gruesome remains and called 911. And it did not take long for the police to identify the victim or the perpetrators. Just after 8 o'clock that evening, hysterical Tony Lawrence arrived at the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, accompanied by her parents. She gave a rambling statement describing the horrendous murder. Accompanied by her parents, she gave a rambling statement describing the horrendous murder, identifying the victim as Shenanda, and naming the three other girls involved. Shenanda had now been had by now been reported missing by her mother, so the pieces came together quickly after that. Loveless, Tackett, and Rippy were arrested on January 12th with the Jefferson County prosecutor declaring his intention to try all four girls as adults. Faced with the very real prospect of the death penalty, the four accused quickly asked for a deal. In terms of those deals, Lori Tackett and Melinda Loveless were sentenced to 60 years at the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis. With time off for good behavior, they could walk free in 2022, when both will be in their mid-40s. Hope Rippey was sentenced to 60 years and was paroled on April 28, 2006, having served just 14. Tony Lawrence, who did not directly participate in the murder, served nine years and was released in December 2000. And that's it. That kind of clears up the case there. Um, I don't know if you want to update on that one. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, I'm going to stop this video here, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.